Welcome everyone. It is May 14th, 2020 to the Situate Planning Board. Um, in the Selectman's Hearing Room via remote participation due to COVID-19. In response to Governor Baker's declaration of a public health emergency and the related emergency executive order dated March 12, 2020, Town of Situate public meetings shall, be, shall meet remotely until further notice. This meeting will be recorded by Situate Community Television, can be viewed live on cable television channel 9, and will be posted on our website the next day. Participation for the public hearing will be available by audio and video conference bridge. For audio participation, call in can be accessed via any of these three numbers, and if the line is busy, please keep trying. Dial any number you ask to join, 425-436-6308. Long distance charges could apply, 425-436-6338. And depending upon your calling plan, 425-436-6300. The access code, 5389 zero eight nine excuse me let's start that over again five three eight nine six zero pound follow the instructions for the calling service you can listen to the audio and your phone line will be muted you will be allowed to ask questions or comment during the moderated question and answer period following the audio directions for video participation HTPS um, colon slash slash join dot freedom free conference call dot com slash situate one follow the instructions on your computer screen to join the meeting your computer microphone will be muted you will be allowed to ask questions or comment during the moderated question answer period following the audio directions hopefully you got all that Okay, moving rapidly, I will um, <clears throat> entertain a motion to accept the agenda. Second. All in favor will call the roll. Ms. Burbine? Yes. Ms. Lambert? Yes. Mr. Pritchard? Yes. Mr. Lindbacher? Yes. Mr. Bornstein? Yes. Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Okay. All right, we have old business, new business, correspondence, and administrative up, um, items update. Okay. The first item is minutes. Uh, Ms. Lewis, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Rebecca, can yeah. you? Thank you. Thank you. I move to approve the meeting minutes for April 23rd, 2020. Is there a second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 You need to do a roll call. We need to technically do a roll call vote. Ms. Burbine? Yes. Mr. Pritchard? Yes. Mr. Lamacher? Yes. 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 Lambert. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Accounting. I move to approve the requisition of four hundred fifty dollars to Merrill Corporation for peer review of Benjamin Studley Farm as built for three hundred forty-two. Dollars fourteen cents to J and R Graphic from Planning Board letterhead and envelopes for one thousand three hundred fifty dollars to Merrill Corporation for peer review of sixty one Border Street Stormwater for two thousand three hundred twenty five dollars to Merrill Corporation for peer review of Deer Common for one hundred eighty seven dollars fifty cents to Chessia Consulting Services LLC. For peer review services for Country Way Residential Compound. 
for $125 to Chessia Consulting Services, LLC, for peer review for stormwater at 36 Barker Road for $4,373 to Horsley Witten Group, Inc., for peer review services associated with Phase 2, associated with Seaside at Situate, for $762.40 to Horsley Witten Group, Inc., for peer review services associated with Phase 1 at Seaside at Situate. Is there a second? Second. Yes. Anyway. Okay, now we have liaison reports. There wouldn't be the background. What? If ever, anybody that moves, because we're not muted, anything they do, you can hear. All right, fine. Thanks. Okay, liaison reports. I attended CPC the other night, and basically we're getting less money than we thought we were, but that's been dealt with. As far as the Mordecai Lincoln property is concerned, there will be a short video at town meeting when and if that when that's held. It's supposed to be the eighth of June, but might be later than that. So that's all I have. Anybody else with liaison reports? Nothing. Bill. No. 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 And no. Nothing on my end. Okay. All right, planning development report. Planning development report. We had five new units added to the subsidized housing inventory in the past week. The four at 50 Country Way and one at 11 Nelson. So those have, those have all been added to the inventory um, as of May 7th. Um, this is a question for the board that I said I would ask the board. Uh, my understanding for the Curtis Estate subdivision is that the impervious area that's listed on the plans is the impervious area for each lot in total impervious that is um, allowed for the lots and the whole development. Um, I just want to verify with the board that that was your understanding, that this is all on the plans, it's written on there, and I'm not going to be dickering around with CN values of anything. Response. Um, Rebecca. Uh, point of order. Yes, um, Ben. Am I, I'm, I'm having a really bad time hearing everyone. It sounds like I'm in underwater in a swimming pool and there's a meeting happening above me on land. Is anyone else having this audio issue or is it just my computer? Yeah, no, I'm having the same problem. I, yeah, I'm having a hard time hearing things that are being said. Okay. We have no idea what that's all about. All right, can you hear me clearly? For the moment. You're very echoey. It has to do with the phone that we have here. We need to turn that down a little bit. All right, how about now? Is that better? Now I can't hear you. If somebody has a phone on, I think you have to mute it. Maybe everyone can mute themselves until we need to have discussion. All right, okay. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Karen asked that we'll, have, we'll try to see if she can get it across to you again, Karen, about Curtis Estates. Curtis Estates has an impervious area for the total and for each lot listed on the plans. That's what I'm going by when I sign off on um, for certificates of occupancy 
and for building permits. I want to make sure that that was the board's understanding that that's the total impervious. We've had some discussion about CN numbers um, for certain pavement that may be pervious or impervious. But my understanding was the board, that th these numbers were put on the drawings and that was what the board wanted. And that's on the endorsed set. Do you all agree with her interpretation? Which um, project are we talking about? Curtis Estates. 90, 90 and vinyl. And what would be the alternative interpretation of what's listed on the drawing? I don't believe there is, except that some people have been trying to argue that um, pavers on stone dust are permeable pavers because they have a CN value of 96. No. Okay. No, absolutely not. That, no. that. that was never part of the discussion, and I don't think that was part of our expectation. That's kind of what I thought, but I said I would bring it back to the board and get your expectation. All right. We're all set with that. Excuse me, Bill? If they want changes, if changes are desired, they have to come back for some type of formal request for changes. So, Karen, just so I'm clear. Yep. Um, are they trying to interpret certain areas on a lot as impervious that meets the impervious definition or the impervious number on the drawing? They're trying to say some are permeable to gain more impervious area on the site. Mm. Uh, that, was, that was never part of our discussion. That's what I thought. So I, that I can convey, I will convey that back to them tomorrow. Thank you. Anything else, Karen? Um, we just remain very busy. We're still get, we're getting new projects in. Um, multiple special permits and site plan administrative reviews and um, things are as busy as ever with stormwater permits and site visits um, so status quo how big are the new projects Karen? Are, are any of them significant users of water um, we have one that's a five unit multifamily one that's a mixed use so they will be using some water, probably not significant. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You'll be, um, when I get the transmittals done, you'll be given copies of the um, information. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Now it is 7 o'clock, and we have a continued public hearing. Special permit, common driveway, and stormwater permit, 443 to 461 Chief Justice Cushing Highway. Assessor's map block lot 47-2-26A to 263. Applicant, David McCready, owner, 7H Trust. Note, meeting materials can be found under the Planning Board webpage under current applications on the Town of Situate website. Please follow link below for access. I gave that to you earlier. So, all right. Um, Mr. Morris, are you on? Yes, I'm here and ready to present. All right, please do. Okay. Give me a, give me a moment. I'm going to share the plan here. Are you able to see the able to see them? No. Okay, hold hold on just a minute. Almost. Coming. Now? No. You can only see your desk. 
Oh, oh, almost. It went, it went away. Let me, let me pull it up one more time. There's, there's, not be, there's a delay, it seems like. Hopefully it pops up in just a little bit here to you. Not yet. No, nope, not yet. <laughs> oh, it, it just disappeared again. Really? Really. So this isn't, uh, you, can't, you can't see it at all? Nope. We'll, yep, yes. it's down. Hey, you can see the thumbnails below. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. yeah. We got it. Nope. It's it's up. Up. There we are. Here's one. We have the one in color. We have the colored one. Yeah, that, that's what I have. I have it up. Yeah, well. Okay, it, okay. Do you have two monitors on, Greg? No, just one. So let's let's reshare the desktop, and you got to reshare the, uh, the your desktop or your application. So you need let me. It worked so perfectly yesterday. Let me try again. I know it worked really perfectly yesterday. <laughs> I'm gonna, Greg. I'm gonna stop presenting and reshare it with you. There we go. We got it now. We have the colored plan, Greg. All right. We are ready to go. Okay. This is this is just a color rendering of the um, project. The detailed plans are available, I think, on the website. Um, that include all of the full detail here, but we've looked at the full detailed plans well in the past. The colors here generally represent the project. Um, as, as you're aware, this is an eight-lot A&R plan, but we're proposing three common driveways, which would provide access to a total of eight duplex buildings. Uh, we've been before the board multiple times before. Merrill Associates has been involved in a peer review for both a stormwater permit associated with this as well as the common driveway application for this. Uh, since our last meeting, we had submitted a set of plans back in January that we felt addressed all of Merrill's outstanding comments. Um, in the primary changes on that, that plan, um, we had relocated the houses on lots one and two, which are the houses at the top of the hill um, up here. Lots one and two, we had rotated these and shortened the driveway, which allowed us to increase this dark green area, which is an undisturbed natural buffer. Um, that undisturbed buffer was increased to a depth now of 40 feet. We also relocated on the bottom side of the project on Rod 8 The septic system is right here where my cursor is, uh, and that provides a 400 foot setback to the tax factory pond, um, pond, which is off the left side of the screen. We provided two parking systems that would be exclusive use to provide access right here. Um, for foot traffic to two existing graves, which are in this dark green bump out area, we provided an easement for those two parking spaces over to those historic grave areas. 
we provided a construction estimate. Uh, the applicant, Dave McCready, wishes to build this project essentially in three phases. Phase one would be construction of lots six, seven, and eight, which are the lower three buildings in the lowest common driveway here. That would be phase one. Phase two would be the second common driveway in the middle for lots three, four, and five. And the top common driveway would be phase three with lots one and two. Lot one, we came in with a construction estimate for the driveway in the drainage infrastructure. It's $250,000. The second driveway is $236,000. And the top one came in at $235,000. So a total of approximately $721,000 for a construction estimate. Um, Merrill had, did not, had done a final review of this. Uh, I believe that they are majority satisfied with the comments um, and that anything that's outstanding is relatively minor and could be incorporated into conditions of approval if you choose to do such. And I turn it back to you. All right. Are you done with your presentation, Greg? Yes. All right, I'll open it up to the board for comment, and we'll start with Mr. Pritchard. A couple, a couple questions. Um, one on the 400 foot setback. Where is that line? Sure. So on the detailed plans, which I can, I can pull up. I don't know if I'll lose them here. The 400 foot is about where my cursor is. It's right in this area. It is depicted on the special permit plans. Our sound is awful. So um, I'm sorry, I can't can't really tell. So is the is the property the building in the 400 foot? Let me let me pull up the plans and you can see. Steve, while we're waiting for Greg to pull it up, from the calculation that I did on a plan, yes, part of the building is in the 400-foot buffer area, 400-foot um, area. So I, I, would, I would confirm that. It's up to scale on my computer screen here, but yes, a portion of the building in Lottie is within the 400-foot setback. Um, the 400-foot setback is an arbitrary setback. It is not a regulatory requirement of anyone. Um, but 400 feet was the requirement for relocating the septic system, and it does comply for the septic system. OK. Um, second question, um, the, I think the numbers we got from, um, from Merrill suggested that the cost of the fill by itself was 581,000. So it sounds like 721 is is a is a low low estimate for the completion of the infrastructure. We we did see that estimate from Merrill. We we got our number from the contractor. That Hopefully, it's going to be doing the site work out here, so we believe it's closer to being accurate of what we will pay. Um, Merrill's pricing also reflects mass DOT pricing, which is typically the prevailing wage. 
as opposed to this is a private project. Steve, I can confirm that Merrill's pricing reflects DOT pricing, and um, because that's what they're, they're they're used to doing, and that's the instructions I gave them. Um, the major, you know, was DOT pricing. Okay. Are you all set, Steve? Or do you have another question? Third question: um, Why are we looking at this in phases? Several, several reasons. One, the applicant wants to build it in phases um, for financial reasons, uh, so it doesn't have the outlay of building the whole project at one time. Secondarily, what we heard from the planning board here was that the desire was essentially that it be a phased project so that you could monitor impacts from each phase and you could build each stormwater system kind of individually and monitor them as the project went on without making one large land disturbance at a time. So why would you start down at the bottom? So the reason why we would start at the bottom is the drainage the drainage runs downhill, and so if we construct the drainage that's at the bottom of the hill and have that completely stabilized, once we get to the second phase, which is the middle driveway, the runoff from that second project will run into a completed stormwater drainage system. It won't be running into a um, rough graded one that's unstabilized and be causing erosion problems. Aren't you going to have to have construction uh, retain, you know, stormwater retainage? I yes, absolutely. To contaminate the, the new stuff. Yes, there would be erosion control in place between the different phases. Um, there's seeding measures in place, and there's temporary sediment basins that are proposed. All right, Steve, you all set? For the moment. Thank you. Bill? No. Let me, let me. Can you hear me now? I hit myself on mute. Yes, we can hear you now. Do you have questions? No, I'm all set right now. Okay. Um, ben? Driveway development, or do they have to function as a human? So, so each, each each system, this the lowest system here handles the lower common driveway and handles the um, development immediately around that. Lot six, seven, and eight. Okay, in its own, it provides ninety percent CSS in all of the infiltration necessary for those three lots are contained within this system. Same with the middle system and the top system. Each driveway in the houses or the duplexes that are serviced by it, the stormwater is completely handled and meets the requirements between the basins that are on either side of the driveway coming in and the infiltrators that are attached to the roof area. So there's no intent between these BMPs to flow down hill in a linear fashion towards the lower unit. So in, in other words, uh, a lot two is BMP won't over top to uh, the BMP in uh, uh, lot four and five and, and, uh, and down the line. Down the, they're all going to be separated. They're not separated. They're not separated. Whales or anything like that. So they, the water does flow downhill and all the stormwater discharges are toward the front of the lot. So 
It is, it is a linear fashion bed. Lot 2 up here at the top of the screen, for example, uh, has an outfall right here where my cursor is. From here, it's going to flow over land, and this is natural vegetation in here. Here's our tree line. It's going to flow through the natural vegetation, and then it's going to get directed to a culvert underneath the driveway. Here's a depression next to the second driveway, and it flows through that culvert into a depression on the opposite side. That has an outlet, which then flows to a swale which goes to natural area. This is natural area in here. But then that gets caught in this depression, which then has a culvert to this rain garden, which ultimately discharges to the back of Lot 8 uh, via this stone overflow. So it, it is a linear fashion, and it was, it was kind of designed that way so that there would be a, a redundancy if there ever was any sort of Spill or contaminant that got into the drainage system, um, it would flow from one drainage system through another drainage system through a third drainage system so that you have that safeguard in effect. In effect. Each system itself, again, is designed to handle the road and the units immediately surrounding. So each one could be a standalone system, but it does have triple redundancy built into it in that linear fashion. Okay. Um, um, so, I guess in a typical, do you know in terms of like a typical rain event or what sort of precipitation level these are designed to overtop and then go through the different channels down to the next BMP? I, I'm, I'm just, I guess my concern is that I'm kind of starting to see, uh, I don't like the idea of creating, I guess, a linear flow of water, it's almost like we're channelizing stormwater and then discharging it closer to the water supply, and that's kind of one of my concerns. Um, so if, if, I guess if you could elaborate how these individual BMPs are handling infiltration before that water overtops and then goes down, um, that would be helpful. Does that make sense? Sure, 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 sure. So, so, so all of the roof runoff, all of the grooves, have their own subsurface infiltration system for the roof line, okay? The driveways themselves, we originally had them going to grass swales um, in discharging into rain gardens, but it was at the request of the town that catch basins were installed. So now we've installed a catch basin essentially at the front of each driveway. And the catch basin serves the purpose of that if there's ever a spill, you could block the outlet of the catch basin. Um, it can control any contaminants in the catch basin. Um, once in the catch basin, the water is directed to uh, an infiltration device, a rain garden. After at least the rain garden, though, at the discharge point, there's a minimum of at least 50 feet of natural vegetation that it goes through and that is not a constructed swale. It returns to natural topography and natural vegetation before it gets directed into the next depressed area. Um, and that, that can be said for the middle system, the top system, and the bottom system. They all discharge into natural areas with natural topography as opposed to swales. Sorry, it's muted. Um, okay, I think I think I'm okay for now. All right, thank you, um, Patty. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question on that? Yes. Um, do each individual lot sort of um, phases and on their own as a stormwater management system? Yes. Yeah. Like, do you only do phase one? Does you would be in full compliance. Yes, each phase stand on, stands on its own. It doesn't rely on the next phase for, for compliance. So it meets the, the uh, runoff limitations and the velocity limitations? Yes. All right, Patty? I'm fine, thank you. All right, Rebecca?
Rebecca? Okay. Where are the reserve system for the septics? Sure. The septics, the septics are primarily these chamber systems here. Um, the reserves are typically right next to them. They're not shown on this grading plan, um, but they'll be shown on the water health septic plans when the time comes. So actually, some of the reserves are are labeled on this plan. Um, Here's, here's a reserve area, for example. Um, here's a reserve area. They're almost all directly adjacent to where the subject systems are going. Okay. Where's the reserve for the lower lot? The lower lot, the, the system is going to be a trench system, and it's behind this septic system here. It's along here and along the side of the existing system. That's the reserve? Yes. Okay. All right. Rebecca, are you all set? Right now, yes. Thank you. All right. I'll open it up to the public. So we're going to go into a Q and A period. Uh, question and answer period. session has started. Okay, yeah. First question. Yeah. First question. Please identify yourself. Um, Robert Chessia, Nine Stearns Road. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, I submitted a letter. I just want to read it and I have a few questions. Um, I live at Nine Stearns Road. Uh, referring to the mounding analysis for the rain garden on lots six through eight, I have a question as to what is implied by the largest infiltration device. Since the mounding analysis is based on volume over area, taking the shape into consideration, wouldn't the shape of a dry well be different than that of a rain garden? The project would potentially have an adverse effect on our water supply. I feel that a mounding analysis should be done on, for all the dry wells. This would ensure that we're doing all we can to protect the town's supply of drinking water. As I have stated in my previous letters, this is a huge development in a sensitive area that would be better addressed by fewer units and a reduced impact. I urge you to think long and hard about permitting this development. And I have a question about common driveways. Um, you can put two units on a common driveway without the okay of the planning board, is that correct? It's a special permit, sir. For all of them? Yes. Okay, well, I hope you uh, say no. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Pat Butler? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, I live at the bottom of the hill, and my concern is that at the last meeting in January, um, Greg Moore said that the water from the hill would flow southerly, and I am southerly. Um, and I understand that some of this water is going to flow onto my property. And I just want to know if that is true and what can be done to keep the water from flowing, like for major rainfall, to keep it from flowing onto my land. All right, get, Greg, can you respond to that? Greg? Yes, so you can see the drawing here um, down the bottom. This is Miss Butler's house right here. And water does, it runs down the hill. It runs to Tax Factory Pond. There's a lot of water that runs off the site today without any development there and runs to the pond. Um, the purpose of doing the drainage calcs, which Merrill reviewed, was to show that we're not increasing 
the rate or the volume of water that runs onto Ms. Butler's property. She already receives this entire development area, the um, 16 plus acres of land already drains onto her property. So we're required to make up the difference of what the rain quality or the, sorry, the storm water increase is when it's developed. And that's what's made up in our detention basins and roof dry well areas. You'll notice with our outfalls, we've included all the outfalls directed um, toward the back of the property. We're not directing outfalls toward Miss Butler's house. And secondarily, we've given a voluntary um, buffer here. All of this area that you see that's hatched is natural vegetation. So the natural vegetation in here, we're maintaining a significant um, buffer to her. That buffer is 150 feet um, of vegetated area. Okay, thank you. Ms. Butler? Okay, so you're, okay, so you're saying, saying that the that water is already water coming onto, onto my property, my property but but, yes. I, I, but I disagree with the fact that, 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 it, 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 that it looks like the, the, like the water is going to flow into the back of my property where you're not going to see it, and there's no and water there's no there. Water there. And, and I guess my question is, is there is, can you is see the water, see the water or, is or is it in the ground? The ground? And how does sure, it get so from it's... one end? And how does it get from one edge of the property to the pond? Okay, so looking at this plan here, this is the existing conditions plan. And water, when it hits the surface of the ground, it runs perpendicular to any contour lines or elevations. And you'll see that all the contours here if you ran a line perpendicular to these little dashed lines, they all point directly toward your property, which is this entire area here. Now, Tack Factory Pond, the edge of the water as it exists today is this dashed line on the left side of the screen. The town of Situate is in the process of increasing the size of Tack Factory Pond, and they want to increase it to where this dashed line is right here. They want to raise the pond approximately 18 inches. The wetlands on your property are the next dashed line right here. So that's considered wet. And then the FEMA floodplain is considered a wet area. And that FEMA floodplain is this dashed line right here on your property. So all of the storm water that where discharges, discharges from the point where my cursor is right now, it discharges from there back on the applicant's property. But it's going to flow downhill, though. It is. It is going to flow downhill. And we did the pre-development analysis, which is just as you see it right now. In the pre-development, all of this land flows to the Butler property. And in the post-development, it certainly will flow to the Butler property as well. But we're retaining enough storm water on the site that we're not increasing the rate or the volume of water to her property. But you're saying, you're saying that, 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 that the water is going to come to my property. And I guess my question is, will I see the water? Or is it groundwater and it's just below? Or Am I going to have any water after a major rainstorm? You, you shouldn't see the water channelized at any locations because when we discharge it, uh, it's being discharged to a level spreader and then it's going through a, a thick natural vegetated buffer area. It's not going through a swale or any sort of man-made device. It's not being channelized. So it, okay. it will be returned to sheet flow. You're not going to physically notice it. Can I ask a clarification question on that, please? Where's the level spreader? Sure. So in the discussions with Merrill, um, it was talked about adding a level spreader, which we agreed to. Um, we have a crushed film discharge right here. And we've agreed in the letters with Merrill, Karen, I believe you're privy to them to add a level spreader um, right here 
on lot eight. All right, so to be fair to everyone listening, the level spreader isn't shown on the drawings yet. Correct? Correct. All right, thank you. All right. What is the level spreader? A level spreader is an extra stone. Typically, it's a stone device that um, helps return any storm water discharges into a heat flow condition to prevent them from being in a channelized flow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next question, please. From who? Karen. Karen, Karen, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thank you um, for taking my call. I had a number of questions, if I may. Go ahead. Um, Did you identify yourself? It's Karen sorry, Canfield. Karen Canfield, 39 Surfside Road, member of the Board of Black Thank you. Um, would the planning board please remind me, is, I was under the impression that stormwater regs required water to be retained on site of any new development. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. You can't increase the, the volume flow or the velocity flow across the property boundaries as existed pre-development. So if, you, if Greg went back to his previous pre-development uh, map, uh, so the, the, the flow across, I'm, yeah. The flow across to the Butler property, there's a certain flow, volume flow, and velocity flow now with a 100-year storm, right? Mm -hmm. And the design, the new design can't increase that, either of those um, elements in the post-development uh, condition. And I, I'm assuming that's the case. And Greg, can you identify what pre- and post-development flows are? Yes, that, yeah. you summarized it pretty good there. Um, so we do an analysis pre-development, looking at the site and the, the characteristics of the site today. And then we do an analysis of the post-development. And we're not allowed to increase that flow. Um, we are allowed to discharge off the site, but you can't increase it at a greater rate than what exists pre-development. Um, the town did hire Merrill Associates to review our calculations which they did, and they are in concurrence with our CALC. Um, our stormwater report, which I'm pulling up here, has a summary of, the discharge rates. Um, if you can see this table that I just pulled up, um, for example, the 100-year storm event, um, discharges existing 52.13 cubic feet per second, and we're proposing 52.07 cubic feet. Um, all of the storm events, we analyzed this for the one year, the two year, the 10 year, the 25, and the 100 year storm events. Um, it's in compliance for all events. And where are design point one and two? That was my question. So design point one is um, the Butler property design point two, I believe, is the um, is the front out on the three A. Hold on, I can. Do. Greg, does that analysis also um, take into factor where the water is going? Does the does the impact of the development change where the discharge of the water will be? If, assuming it's all the same amount of water, does it matter where it goes as opposed to where it went? Not, it, it does take that into consideration. Um, in this case here, oh, where's that plan? In this case here, the, um, there's not like a finite point along the Butler property, a culvert or a, or a specific discharge point. It's a, it's a rather flat contour all the way across at the lot line. And so we're analyzing it at the lot line, but as you can see, the lot line here is 
um, several hundred feet in length from 3A to the back. So we're returning the water after it comes through our stormwater system to what you would expect to see out there today, which is that sheet flow condition. We're, we're providing it in a non-channelized form. Um, our intent was to, even though it's non-channelized and it's in that sheet flow condition, our intent was to take that water and send it, you know, as far back on the property as possible. Uh, because the area back here, this line um, is the floodplain here, this, this line. So if we were discharging it into the floodplain location um, and into where the closest point where the wetlands exist at the site uh, on the Butler property, that would be, you know, of least impact to anyone. But I don't know that you're going to see an impact because we are returning it to that sheet flow condition. Could I ask a question, please? Uh, you've analyzed every point along the Butler property? I mean, you're saying that you ha it's not going to increase in rate or volume at the whole Butler property. You've analyzed every point along the Butler property. Yes. Karen? A uh, couple more questions, Madam Chair. Um, Greg, what you say there's natural vegetation that's going to be between, uh, as a buffer between the properties. Is that going to be planted? And if so, what is the anticipated vegetation? And, it, and to the planning board, is that required on your, um, on your consideration? Shouldn't be on the so the vegetation that's out there is a undisturbed area. So it's natural vegetation. It's whatever's out there today. Okay. It's not being supplemented, but it's the existing vegetation that's out there. And I've zoomed in here, um, the Butler house where my cursor is here. This, this line here, this represents our tree, our proposed tree line or limit of clearing. And so as you can see, all of this area between that limit of clearing into the Butler property line down here. This is all going to remain as existing forest as it is today. Um, that's in excess of 150 feet of natural vegetation that's there. Is that going to be a permanent restriction on the homeowner of Lot 8? So on our A&R plan that was submitted, we're putting in a, a restriction in perpetuity of all of the area that is hatched here, not just down here, but it also runs along the properties here on the back of um, Burns Road, Old Forge Road. Um, but secondarily, a special permit would have a limitation on limiting the limit of work to the proposed limit of clearing here, which is what this line is. So, no, I get that. I think what I'm concerned about is the home, once the homeowner gets it, there's nothing that prevents the homeowner from clearing up to the easement, if you will. Um, so that could be a restriction if you were to issue a special permit. That's a restriction that you could write into your special permit, that there be um, either signage along that no disturbed area um, or boulders placed along that no disturbed area to prevent that future encroachment. Okay. All right, Karen. Thank you. Um, I know that the planning board has discussed this, and I'm sorry that I didn't participate in the conversation, but um, what would it, um, I think the curb cuts to 3A are problematic, so I just want to be brought up to see to the planning board's feeling and what, um, what potential restrictions, if any, could be made, if they could be a common driveway or or what, because that's, that's just concerning. Well, we have been through all of this, Karen, and... Yeah, I know, I'm sorry, I apologize, I forgot and, where the conversation went. Okay, and, and the thing is, too, you'll have to wait and see in our conditions in terms of these common driveways. We don't have anything from MassDOT in terms of the curb cuts, and according to the applicant, we would not be, uh, would not be able to have that until after he receives his permits. So um, that's sort of up in the air, but I'm sure in our conditions you will find that things are addressed. Okay, my last 
question is, is for my education, is this is adjacent obviously to a public drinking water supply. So from a, building a septic field, what are the, re, what are the, I should know this, but I don't, with the town um, um, protection, you know, this is, this to me just feels very close to a public water supply. Um, are they in compliance with um, our regulations to protect that supply? Again, um, so the Constituent Board of Health will have to approve the septic plans on each of these individual lots. The Constituent Board of Health requirements and the state DEP requirements are that septics be set back a minimum of 200 feet from the tax factory pond. We comply with a setback of 400 feet with the closest septic system here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All That's right. all I had, Madam Chair. Thank you. You have another question. All right, another question. Hello, may I ask a, que uh, a question? Yes, would you please identify yourself, sir? Oh, yes, I am uh, James Hunt of Manlot Road in God's country of North Situate. James, how are you? Well, I am quite elegant, thank you, uh, confined to my quarters, but uh, I'm branching out uh, once in a while. But I must, my, my question is more of a statement. I am astounded that a project of this magnitude is, is proceeding in a, in a venue of limited capacity and technologically uh, complicated when I really believe that this should be deferred until all parties can see the plans and interact one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, without the complication of this overly complicated uh, electronic medium. I, I am astounded that this project is proceeding in, in, in this manner. So I, I would just ask that this be deferred, continued, or laid on the table until the current restrictions are eased and we can discuss this in open meeting face to face. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. I would like to address that, Mr. Hunt. Um, please understand that we have an upcoming election on the 13th of June, and as it stands, if we were to defer this, potentially there would be two new members to the board, and we would have to start the process all over again. And we would prefer not to do that. So I understand your concerns. I do. And I agree that this electronic, what have you, leaves a lot to be desired. Unfortunately, this is what we have to deal with at this point in time. We had five public hearing sessions. And we have had I respond? Uh, one, I respond? one more second. We have had five public hearings on this project. Five. And you would like to respond, sir? I, I would. The inconvenience of a renewal of the board membership is a is a concern for sure. But this project presents significant impacts to our public drinking water supply and should not be relegated to the expedience of the upcoming election. This is a serious matter, and as much as I respect and honor Greg's engineering expertise, there is a lot of this that needs to be further explored, and I believe that proceeding in this venue with a limited public participation is a big mistake. Thank you very much. Thank I you. Sign off with that. Okay. Um, one, more one more question. Ms. Butler? Oh. This is Pat Butler again at the bottom of the property. I just have one huge question. Okay, so if the water 
is going to come down onto my property, right? And you're going to change the slope of the hill by bringing in fill, and you're going to clear out the whole center at approximately 50% of the area. How is there going to be less water coming down the hill? There cannot be more water coming down the hill than there is now under the stormwater permits. Greg, would you care to answer that, please? Sure. There's several things to consider when it comes to stormwater runoff. Um, one of them is the slope of the land. And there are several locations here where we've flattened out um, side yards over the septic systems. Um, backyards, all of these areas that we've flattened out so that you're not getting um, almost instant runoff of stormwater from the site, but now that it's a flat surface, you're promoting infiltration. You're promoting that water to go down and into the soil in those locations. Secondly, we physically are taking the roof areas here of every building, and we're directing those into subsurface dry well systems. What that means, Ms. Butler, is we're essentially constructing a, a septic system to handle any of the water that comes off of the roof when it rains. So we're taking all of that water and directing it into the ground. Lastly, we're taking the drainage associated with the driveways and we're putting those into um, grass depressions. We have a total of six of them, two on each driveway. Um, those grass depressions, uh, how many more? are a couple feet deep right. and they promote infiltration of soil or infiltration of water into the soil underneath them and they retain water um, up to a certain elevation before it overtops and goes into a surface uh, runoff again. So we're retaining water in each of the stormwater basins, we're retaining water in each of the dry well systems and we're promoting infiltration through the site grading. Okay, so okay. so you build the the development, and just say the water comes down, and it's coming down, down. like it normally does, and so it's a, so it's a lot. And so, and so what is what is, is, is there a contingency plan to to capture some of this water if in fact it overflows onto my property? So. <laughs> As, as you just stated, there's already water that flows onto your property. And when this system is built, there still will be water that flows onto your property. We are not capturing all of them. You can't. All right, thank you very much. We have one more question, and then we will terminate discussion. And who is on the line now? Hi, this is Judy Aronson. Um, I grew up at the house, the Butler house. And what is your address today? buffer that's going to be untouched along the stone wall of our property. And my question is, that 150 looks really wide at the beginning of the highway, but slowly gets really smaller at the end of the property. And if that area that's going to be untouched is 150 feet, wide, right? Where is the buffer line from the pond that they're going by? I mean, I'm looking at the drawings. I'm like, if that's 150 feet, then another 150 feet, that's only 300 feet. You know, they, it, I don't know. They say they're going to go back 400 feet, but obviously that septic, he agreed, it's, it's in that 400 foot area. He so just can't say, he can't say that he's going back 400 feet when I know he doesn't have to because that's not the requirement. Um, my thought of it is I think the plan looks great. That back area, that little tiny area is where I would think that the water was going to flow to like go around our property. 
And if you see, that very back area is just a small area. And that goes right into our drinking water. And it's yeah. just slow yeah. for the project. You know, it looks good on paper if it was just at a flat ground. Um, I looked up rain gardens and catch basins, retention basins, and what I found is it's not suitable for a slope more than 20 degrees. So, I mean, I don't know what angle that hill is, but to me, if they clear that, I just feel more water than we've ever got. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we're all we're all set. Yes, please. We're going to end the Q and A. And Q and A session is over. Do we have any further comments from the board before I get into um, the special permit, stormwater permit? Yeah, I got a question on the infiltration. Yes. I guess, Greg, are we taking credit for any infiltration in any of the rain gardens? Yes, we are. And for the, what about the grass depression? Yes, we take we take credit in the grass depressions, and we take credit in the rain gardens. They they all comply with the three foot groundwater requirements. Okay, and you're, we, you're going across this your hatched area at the end of the property. Is that going to have any infiltration when you direct the water in there? You will get some natural infiltration as water runs across the ground surface, but not significant infiltration just given the existing contours of the land. Okay, and then so the other question I've got is how much difference is there between the bottom of the, the gardens and the, the groundwater? Three, three feet. Exactly three feet or greater than three feet? It's designed at three feet. The state requirement is two, situate requires three, um, and we've designed them at three feet. Do you have to bring fill in to get that? Uh, approximately half, half the bottom of the basin is in fill. The other half is cut into the natural grain. That's the case for all of them? Correct. All right, any other questions from the board? I, I have a question on, on the fill and the basins and all this. Um, so I'm, I'm in the landscape design trade and frequently on new construction lots, I can't tell you how often this is, I deal with hard and compacted soils in otherwise seemingly lawn areas that would be credited for some level of infiltration that have effectively zero infiltration. What are you going to do during your construction sequencing and phasing to, to assure that the developed areas are not highly compacted, particularly in the areas of stormwater BMPs, so that we don't render what would otherwise be credited with infiltration um, impermeable? So the, um, the areas for the basins would be staked out. You'd limit any heavy machinery over those areas, and you'd limit disturbance in those areas up until the time that the basins are constructed. Um, we did propose temporary basins to be built during construction. Um, we proposed a temporary sediment basin back here, um, and we have another, another one up gradient, temporary basin here on lot five in a temporary basin here so that we're not using the areas that we intend on as being our final uh, constructed systems during the construction phase. So those are completely off limits during the construction phase. We do have temporary basins that would be installed um, to limit disturbance in the final areas. Okay, and, and I'm assuming there'll be a responsible party on premises while this is all the site work is being conducted to assure that this happens? Yes. 
Um, and also, how about the cleared lawn and landscaped areas around the buildings? And um, I know the soil absorption system is kind of a standalone, but I mean that that applies too, to some extent. But I guess how are we going to assure that these areas are actually receiving the amount of infiltration that they're cr credited with in in your um, stormwater modeling calculation? Good question. So how they're how they're designed is the um, is the driveways drain to the rain garden areas and then the roofs all drain to subsurface dry wells so and, you know but I guess I'm asking for I'm, I guess I'm asking about that in between area so kind of like the lawn area not the driveways not the buildings themselves but the the seeded loamed and seeded areas or landscaped areas yep so, so you would be required to submit um, as built plans you know, as we go along, and then uh, we'd be doing construction phase stakeouts with grades on them for the roads and then grades for all of the proposed foundations. And so as long as the grading is in, um, you know, substantial compliance with what's designed here, all of the areas that we've assumed are draining in particular directions with our analysis, you know, would, would come to fruition. But it is reliant on uh, either my firm or another firm laying out the grades here so that everything is draining in the appropriate fashion is reliant on that. Um, how much, excuse me, Ben, um, Greg, how much more disturbance will there be for the temporary basins? Temporary basins, if I had to approximate an area, um, probably half to three quarters of an acre in size for temporary basins that gets disturbed. Okay. All right, Ben. I just have a follow-up question on Ben's question about compaction, right? Um, given that most of this site, there's a significant amount of fill that you're going to have to compact it in, in layers as you, as you apply it, right? So how does that impact the permeability of the uh, of the non you know roof and road areas so the the compaction would really be limited to the areas um, under the common driveways and then the compaction in the areas around the rain gardens would really be limited to just being in the the berms around it you would not do any compaction in the floor areas or the areas where you would want any sort of infiltration um, so you'd have you'd have to limit where the compaction happens. Is that is that planned? Yes. Okay. So the areas where the lawns are going, you're not bringing in fill, you know, a foot or two at a time and compacting it to some level and doing the next level. You, you would you would do you would do fill and lips. Exactly. You bring fill and you grade it off and compact your areas of fill. Um, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't do any compaction in the areas proposed for the septic system or the areas proposed for the uh, root dry wells or the areas proposed for the drainage basins. But the other areas, you certainly would do that, Steve. You would do um, typically a 12-inch lift at a time and compact it. So that would be the lawn area. Yes, the, lawn the lawn areas, the driveway areas, um, all of the roadway itself, those areas, yep. The temporary basins ought to have to be right about ground level, or water, groundwater level. Uh, they generally are. We have, um, we have them shown on the plan here. We have the proposed contours on them, and essentially we're building up a berm on the downhill side. Uh, in digging out slightly on the uphill side, but you are correct; they're at they're at ground level, so that they'll hold they'll hold water from up gradient. Okay. All right, people. Also, three feet above groundwater. Um, they're let's see. They're not required to be because they're not an infiltration device. Um, but for example, the top one here, the existing grade is 
91, we're dropping the proposed to 89 for the temporary basin. Um, down the bottom here, this one, the bottom grade looks like it's elevation 51 for the floor of the basin in existing grade. Okay. Uh, I close. I the answer to this, and maybe Merrill has already addressed it, but did you do the stormwater calculations based on the, the uh, operation only of the temporary basins? We've done calcs based on the construction phase using just the temporary basins. And we've done calculations for the final development utilizing only the final stormwater systems. And so on the temporary basin side, um, along the full Butler property line, there's, there's no net increase in volume or velocity? No, there isn't. However, during the construction phase, um, the temporary basins, they only have you size those um, for a 10-year storm event. But what happens if it's a 100-year storm? We all get wet. Huh. But what happens, particularly on this project, though, if you're in construction and that happens? Do we, so, do we flood a lot of sediment into the drinking water? No, I really don't think you do. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we really want to phase the project. We don't want to go in and clear cut the whole site at once. We want it to go in and do limited clearing at any given time. Um, you know, this basin here, the closest basin to the reservoir um, is, is close to 300 feet away. The septic system being 400, the basin's 300 feet away at its closest point, and it's natural vegetation the entire way. Um, on top of that, we proposed this dashed line here, which is a silt sock that would be constructed um, at the Town Gradient Limited Work. So if there was any um, erosion coming off of the site, um, you would have that silt sock there to help hold it. And then lastly, you know, if we were anticipating a 100-year storm event, if the meteorologists were right, you know, there are other implementation methods that the contractor could use, putting uh, hay bales out on any disturbed slopes or any temporary netting if that was anticipated, uh, having a rainfall of that intensity, nine inches in 24 hours. So in other words, you do have a backup plan for a catastrophic event? Yes. Okay. All right, are we all set with the board? No, yeah, can I ask a question? Certainly. Um, this is a more long-range issue. I have a concern about all of these private streets that we're approving. I happen to live on one of them. Um, it is a great concern to be in an HOA where people really do not know anything about stormwater management or about taking care of stuff like this. We have no town oversight. At what point does this not fail completely and they just say, well, we didn't know we were supposed to do that? That's my real big concern about all these private developments. Point well taken. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Hmm? Do we have more people? All right, hang on one second. Do we have people waiting to talk? I think we're all set. All right, I am going to um, move to make the following findings of fact. One, David McCready, the applicant, filed an application for a special permit and stormwater permit for three common driveways serving eight lots at 443 to 461 Chief Justice Cushing Highway, known as Assessor's Map Block Lot. 47-2-26A-26J, the property, with the town clerk on June 21, 2019. The property is owned by the 7H Trust, William Harrington, Jr., and Angela Harrington, trustees. Kathleen P. Muncy of Delaney and Muncy, PC, signed the letter of authorization to file for her client, 7H Trust. 
The applicant's deed is recorded with the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds at Book 16306, page 11. The public hearing dates and the plans are listed in the procedural summary and the plan summary. Two. Three common driveways are proposed. According to the application, each driveway is measured from the property line. The first driveway, located at the south end of the site, is 339 feet long and serves three lots. The second driveway, located in the middle of the site, is 243 feet long and serves three lots. The third driveway, located at the north end of the site, is 140 feet long. It serves two lots. The common driveways will serve eight duplex units or 16 units in total. The property is intended to be developed in a condominium form of ownership administered by a condominium unit owner's trust, hereafter Wade Commons Condominium Trust. Three, the property has an area of approximately 15.3 acres. The property is located in the residence R1 zoning district and in the water resource protection district with the southern portion of the property also located in the Zone A Surface Water Protection Zone. A small portion of the property along its southern border is in the Floodplain and Watershed Protection District. The property was divided into eight parcels in accordance with a Form A plan which was endorsed by the Planning Board on June 27, 2019. Four, Old Oak and Bucket Pond is a Class A water body and has a 400-foot surface water protection zone in accordance with the drinking water regulation, regulations in 310 CMR 22. The applicant, however, claims the Tack Factory Pond is a tributary to Old Oak and Bucket Pond and is therefore a tributary to the surface water source, which sources require only a 200-foot protection zone. The applicant's engineer indicated in a letter to the planning board dated 2-4-2020, the TAC factory pond is not a surface water supply. Upon further review, the, zoning, the town zoning bylaw under section 520.2A and G states that Old Oak and Bucket Pond, TAC factory pond, and the reservoir and their watersheds and tributaries and, ground, and the groundwater underlying situate are the primary source of situate's existing and future drinking water supply and it is of critical importance to the town both that both the surface water supply and its zones of contribution to the public water supply wells be protected from contamination by human activities to the greatest extent possible. In addition, the town's zoning bylaw establishes a water resource protection district to include areas significant to the town's drinking water supply source which require zoning protection. Based on this information, the Water Resources Commission, Department of Public Works, DPW, DPW Engineering Division, and Water Department commented, see comments from DPW Engineering dated 12-11-2019 and from an email from Becky Malamut, Chair of the Water Resource Committee dated 1-23-20 that while TAC Factory Pond is a tributary to a public water supply, it is in itself a surface water source, as that term is defined in regulations and should be treated as such. According to 310 CMR 22, a tributary has a specific definition as follows. Tributary means, en means, means any body of running or intermittently running water which moves in a defin definite channel naturally or artificially created in the ground to a hydraulic gradient and which ultimately flows into a class A surface water source. As defined in 314 CMR 4.053A, class A tack factory pond does not fit this definition as it does not run in a definite channel but rather has the characteristics of a class A surface water source, a naturally impounded water body that is contained by naturally created boundaries. Consequently, DPW and the Water Resource Committee recommended that the 400 foot protection zone be maintained and such protection zone be measured from the proposed TAC factory pond expansion project boundaries as described immediately below. 
Furthermore, the applicant appropriately identified that the future water's edge of the drinking water supply will be approximately 18 inches higher than the existing water edge. This elevation increase estimate was provided by the Town of Situ DPW and its consultant and was filed f filed for in the res Reservoir Dam Water Storage and Fis Fish pa Passage Improvements Project, EEA number 15711. This project proposes to raise Reservoir Pond and Tack Factory Pond maximum water levels by 1.5 feet in order to provide greater surface water storage capacity for the town's drinking water. In the ENF certificate issued by the Secret Certificate of the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs in response to the Environmental Notification Form, ENF, for that project dated July 21, 2017, the Secretary stated that the project described in the ENF is intended to provide water storage for the Town of Situate's public water supply and improve fish, fish passage at the Reservoir Dam Fishway and downstream locations. The Secretary's certificate further provides that according to the ENF, the Reservoir Dam was constructed as a storage reservoir for the Town of Situate's public water supply. The certificate also states that Reservoir Pond and Tack Factory Pond are classified as Zone A surface water supply protection areas and outstanding resource waters, ORW, of the Commonwealth to protect the public drinking water supply. Based on this information, the board concluded that, one, the protection zone should be 400 feet, and two, such protection zone should be measured as proposed by the applicant from the water's edge created by the 1.5 feet increase in the reservoir's maximum water elevation. Five. The project shows on-site waste disposal systems, including eight septic systems, but the systems do not all show the reserve systems as required by Title V. All of these systems are located inside the Water Resource Protection District, but they are located out of the 400-foot protection zone. As not all reserve systems are shown, there is no information to show that all of the reserve systems are out of the 400-foot protection zone. Six. The Water Resource Protection District requires all runoff from impervious surfaces to be recharged on the site, diverted toward areas covered with vegetation from surface infiltration to the extent possible or is otherwise directed from the situate DPW. The DPW has commented in a letter to the board dated 12-11-2019 that, quote, the density and future loading on the parcel with a 400-foot protection setback should be considered an elimination of the development of lots one and two, the northernmost parcels, will allow the development to shift uphill and provide a greater buffer to the drinking water supply, end quote. This would help with a proposal, with a proposed purpose of the common driveway bylaw to protect sensitive natural areas from disturbance, including stormwater runoff. Seven, the zoning bylaw in section 520.5F restricts the rendering of impervious surface of any lot slash parcel to no more than 15% or 2,500 square feet, whichever is greater, unless a system of artificial recharge of precipitation is provided that meets the design requirements of section 520.5F. F. The bylaw further restricts the rendering impervious in zone A to no more than 20% with artificial recharge. The applicant states that no more than 12.3% of the property is rendered impervious for the entire development and the water quality will not be degraded as evidenced in a sign and stance statement by engineer Gregory P. Morse dated 10 19 Subsequently on 2-4-20, Mr. Morse submitted a revision to the original statement which revision stated that the overall impervious coverage is 13.3% of the property and that with lot four and lot seven exceeding the 15% limit at 23% and 26% respectively, but indicated a system of artificial recharge has been provided. One inch of roof runoff is recharged and the first inch of runoff is recharged for all impervious areas according to DEP requirements.
8. The zoning requirements of a common driveway require that the location and construction of any common driveway should minimize soil disturbance, vegetation removal, and drainage impacts and preserve existing trees over 12-inch caliper and other natural features of, of special significance. The plan shows soil disturbance and vegetation removal as generally limited to what is necessary for constructing the common driveways, their drainage systems, eight duplexes for a total of 16 units, and eight septic systems. The proposed stormwater management system has been reviewed by the town's consulting engineer, Merrill engineers, and land surveyors, whose comments indicate the stormwater system has been adequately addressed with the latest revised plans, although no mounding analysis was provided for the subsurface roof infiltration units. The applicant states that soil disturbances are minimized, vegetation removal is minimized as there is proposed, an undisturbed buffer in excess of the applicant's proposed 200-foot buffer, which varies in width from approximately 60 feet to 160 feet in width, confined to one area at the south end of the site closest to Tack Factory Pond. Project engineer Gregory Morse also maintains Drainage impacts are minimized as the drainage system mitigates impacts so that post-construction rates and volumes are less than pre-construction rates and volumes, that trees over 12-inch caliper are only disturbed in the development area and other natural features of special significance are protected, i.e. tack factory pond. Sedimentation sumps are provided to minimize erosion and sedimentation during construction. Although their proposed sizing meets SWIP and NEPTI's requirements of 3,600 cubic feet of storage per acre, it does not address the town's concerns regarding protecting the drinking water supply and tack factory pond as natural features of special significance. Moreover, the plan does not afford protection of adjoining premises against detrimental methods of utilizing the site as a per as a Propose of a common driveway is also pr purpose of a common driveway is also to protect quote sensitive natural areas from disturbance, including storm runoff. Based on the findings of fact presented in numbers one through eight, the common driveways do not meet the standards of section seven twenty point seven a nine. The proposed common driveways are twenty four feet in width with two foot grass shoulders on each side. There is a one foot wide bituminous concrete berm at the entries of the common drives on the south side of them to direct water away from the site entries to the state highway to the site drainage system. The common driveways meet the requirements of, seven, of section 720.7b. The common driveways, this is number 10, are proposed to access Chief Justice Cushing Highway, a public road in situate and a state highway that is owned and controlled by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, MDOT, which access requires a permit from MDOT. The common driveways are not connected to each other and are not allowed by zoning bylaws to be connected. A permit from MDOT has not been obtained yet for the three driveways, as the applicant has indicated, a permit will not be issued without, without town approval of the development. There is no correspondence or permit applications with MDOT, as requested by the board, to evidence that MDOT would consider permitting curb cuts for the proposed common driveways or eight curb cuts permits for Form A lots. The common driveways does not meet the requirement of Section 720.7c. 11. A common driveway is required to be located in an easement that allows space for both the driveway and for the installation of water lines and utilities. A water line is shown on each common driveway plan in the easement along with a gas and electric line. Thus, water lines and utilities are shown as underground utilities. The common driveways meet the requirements of Section 720.7d. 12. The common driveway Cross section shows a top course of one and a half inch of a bituminous concrete top course type I-1 over one and a half bituminous base type I-1 over 12 inch process gravel base type C gravel borrow per mass dot spec M1.03.1. 
the common driveways meet the requirements of section 720.7e. 13, the common driveways are approximately 339 feet, 243 feet, and 140 feet long, measured from the end of cul-de-sac to the property line. Each distance is less than 1,000 feet and, re meet, and meets the requirements of section 720.7f. 14, the applicant has indicated that there will be no increase in rate or volume of runoff to abutting properties for the 1, 2, 10, and 100 year 24 hour storm events. The town's consulting engineer, Merrill Engineers and Land Surveyors, indicated the stormwater management system is satisfactory and runoff draining to abutting properties will not exceed that which existed prior to construction of each of the common driveways. Therefore, the common driveways meet the requirements of 720.7G. 15. No impervious areas are located above the major components of the proposed septic systems. The common driveways, therefore, meet the requirements of Section 720.7H, as no impervious areas are above the proposed septic systems. 16. The common driveways are proposed to be buffered from Chief Justice Cushing Highway by a 50-foot no disturbance buffer. This will provide better traffic safety and reduce visual impacts on abutting properties due to the setback from the property with existing trees providing a buffer. The common driveways meet the requirement of section 720.7 I for screening. 17, turnarounds for emergency vehicles shall be provided with a minimum length of 30 feet and a width of 20 feet in locations approved by the fire chief. The common driveways each have cul-de-sacs that enable sufficient turnaround area for the situate fire department. The situate fire department, uh, situate fire Street Deputy Fire Chief stated that the fire department had no issue with the cul-de-sacs. The common driveways meet the requirements of Section 720.7J. 18, the town's consulting engineer has indicated that stopping site distance requirements and intersection site distances at each common driveway entrance meet the, Associ the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials AASHTO standards. The plans also indicate that vegetation within the site triangles will be removed and such removal maintained as necessary to ensure adequate site distances are provided. The common driveways meet the requirements of section 720.7K. 19. Lot width for the lots served by each common driveway may be measured parallel to a common driveway except in the case of 50 foot frontage lots. The lot widths of 2, 3, 5, 6, and 8 are measured parallel to the common driveway. The common driveways meet the requirements of section 727L. 20. Two historic graves have been identified on the site in an area surrounded by stone wall at the northeast corner of the site. Foot access as well as vicular access for repairs and maintenance will be provided to the grave so that the town of Situate may maintain them. 21. Based on these findings and information submitted by the applicant and reviewed by the board, the common driveways do not meet the requirements of Section 720 of the Situate uh, Zoning Bylaw. Based upon the testimony presented at public hearing plans, documents. Just vote on the findings of fact, Ian. Yep. I think we have to vote on the findings of fact, and then we would go into conditions. All right. Would you make them? Um, all right, there's a motion to vote on the findings of fact. We'll have a roll call. All those in favor of the findings of fact? You need a second. Yeah, oh, you need a second, please. Some second. Okay. All those in favor that the um, findings of fact do not meet. And before you, just before you vote, is there any discussion from anybody? Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay. Um, do not meet the requirements of the section of 720 of the Situate Zoning Bylaw. All those in favor? Ms. Burbine? Aye. Mr. Pritchard? Yes. Mr. Lindbacher? Mr. Lindbacher? 
Bill? No, I, I'm here. Uh, I, I was trying to I had to lower the window to raise, just raise the window so you could hear me. <laughs> How do you vote? Yes. Bill? Yes. Patty? Ms. Lambert? Yes. Mr. Borstein? Yes. Aye. Okay. All right. Based upon the testimony presented at the public hearing, plans, documents, and comments submitted, and the findings of fact, I move to um, approve the special permit for the three comments. What? Uh, a question. Maybe yeah. Karen can guide us in that. Um, given that we've indicated that the findings of fact do not meet the requirements of the bylaw, uh, yes. I don't think we can proceed to approve anything. This the conditions would be the conditions would be based on if you were going to approve the project. So I think you should need to go through the conditions and then take a vote on the project in the end. Bill? Yes. What is your thought on this? I think we can come back up and go into it. So it was going to be to go through and go through each of the conditions so the conditions are there. All right. Okay, Steve, I'll go through the conditions. Okay. All right. One, three common driveways shall be constructed according to plans entitled Proposed Common Driveways, Lot 1 through 8, Chief Justice Cushing Highway, Assessor's Parcel. 47-2-26A-26J, prepared for, <clears throat> for the applicant by Morse Engineering Company, Inc., dated 424-19 with revisions through 129-2020, um, consisting of eight sheets, and is further revised to meet these conditions. Two, lots one and two, lots three, four, and five, and lots six, seven, and eight shall access over the three common driveways as depicted on the plans. No additional extensions or attachments of any other roadways or common driveways or access to any other than those specifically created by and shown on the plan shall be permitted. The common driveways shall remain private in perpetuity and shall never be considered for acceptance as a town road. All maintenance and repair of the common driveway and drainage facilities shall be the sole responsibility of the property owners who comprise the condominium association. A note shall be placed on the plan and deed for each lot serviced by the common driveway stating the above with proof provided to the planning board prior to occupancy of the first unit. Three, the applicant shall mean the current applicant and its successors in interest, the applicant. This special permit shall lapse within two years from the date of its issuance, which shall not include such time required to pursue or await determination of any appeal under Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A, from the grant thereof unless substantial use of construction has commenced prior to that time in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 9. The Planning Board may extend such period for good cause shown upon receiving a written request from the applicant prior to the expiration of said period, <coughs> which shall provide a detailed description of good cause necessitating an extension. For the applicant shall be responsible for maintaining all driveways, water systems, and utilities within the development until such time as maintenance becomes the responsibility of the condominium association, which shall then maintain all driveways, stormwater systems, and utilities. Such responsibility includes, but is not limited to, the period when and if lot, individual lots are sold for and are under construction of homes by other builders. As part of this transfer of responsibility, the applicant shall provide the condominium association the initial amount of $25,000 as an insurance against any rain, garden, or stormwater issues occurring in the first three years. 
At the end of the third year, the balance shall be refunded to the applicant if all of the units have been sold. If all of the units are not sold, then agreed upon prorated portion shall remain in the account and be funded by the applicant. This money is not intended to replace any other project requirement, but rather augmented by creating an initial base level. The condominium association shall furnish proof to the town planner that the funds are in an account and to meet their responsibilities on an annual basis. Five, the post-construction operation and maintenance plan shall be strictly adhered to so that 90% total suspended solids, TSS, is achieved is achieved at all times. An annual report shall be provided to the planning board yearly by March 30, certifying all required maintenance has been completed per the plan by a licensed stormwater professional. The condominium association shall contract to provide a biannual street sweeping and biannual inspection and maintenance, including vacuuming of the roof dry wells. Turf management contract shall be provided with a prohib prohibition on use of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and fertilizers. Six, the applicant shall obtain the endorsement of the planning board on the special permit plans with 180 days of expiration of the appeal period and this decision becoming final. Seven, there shall be no further division or subdivision of any lots any lot shown on the plan for purposes of constructing additional units or buildings. There shall be no further expansion of any building or impervious surface on the site. No additional dwelling units other than the 16 approved by this permit and served by the three common driveways as shown on the plans shall be constructed. The total number of bedrooms in these units shall not exceed 48. No additional expansion of the limit of work is allowed without further approval of the Citra Planning Board. These restrictions shall be contained in the master deed for the condominium association and shall be noted on the plans to be signed by the board and recorded at the registry of deeds. Eight, the applicant shall allow members of the town, members and the town official from the planning board and other persons acting under the planning board or its agents to enter upon the land and carry out such surveys and inspections as may be need necessary and place and maintain monuments. The applicant shall cooperate with the planning board and town officials and assist them in their effort to verify that the layout, design, and construction work of the special permit are satisfactory and conform to town special specifications and requirements of the board. Prior nine, prior to the pre-construction conference, the applicant shall obtain all necessary approvals from the Board of Health, Conservation Commission, Fire Department, Building Department, DPW, and these shall be deemed conditions of the planning board approval. Any state and federal permits must be obtained through MassDOT and NPDES permits and shall be supplied to the planning office prior to scheduling the pre-construction conference and are deemed to be conditions of planning board approval. 10, construction shall meet all requirements of the situate bylaw. All conditions of approval shall be inscribed on the special permit plan. Prior to planning board endorsement, all contractors are responsible for all conditions shown on the plan and all the written and in the written decision. 11, no new in-ground irrigation systems are allowed to connect to the town's water distribution system or in any manner use municipal water. In accordance with this policy rule, all irrigation systems installed in situate must be supplied by on-site sources at the expense of the property owner. Fines for violating this rule may be levied on the homeowner as well as the system installer. 12. Prior to the pre-construction conference, the applicant shall retain a professional geologist, water so resource engineer, hydrologist, or, hydro or hydrologist approved by the planning board to confirm there are no direct or intimate, intimate tributaries on site that would cons constitute a tributary to TAC Factory Pond and therefore require a 150-foot foot buffer as required by the Water Resource Protection Zoning Bylaw. Said professional opinion must be supported by a review of current data and actual site information. Should a tributary be found, a modification of the special permit will be required. 13, two historic graves on the site, which are currently surrounded by stone walls, shall be preserved. The applicant is providing a grave access easement 
for the town to maintain the graves. The applicant has provided two parking spaces at the end of Lot 1 and Lot 2 cul-de-sac for grave parking. Access to the graves is by foot with vehicular access to be provided for repairs and maintenance only. A sign shall be provided by the applicant at, that the parking is for the exclusive use of for access to the graves. A grave access easement shall be recorded with the deed to the property, special permit plans, decision, condominium master deed, and condominium association. 14. The septic systems shall be located no closer to Tack Factory Pond than the approximate 405 feet to the linear of the proposed system on Lot 8 as shown on the plan, including a reserve area. The septic system shall meet all the requirements of Title V and 310 CMR 22, including locating the reserve area outside of the 400-foot buffer. If required by the Board of Health, the applicant shall also provide <clears throat> phosphate removal and additional treatment to ensure the protection of water quality of Tack Factory Pond. The final septic system design and provisions for inspection and maintenance shall be subject to approval by the Board of Health. Any changes to the plan necessitated by compliance with any BOH provision requires written notification to the town planner to determine if the change is significant and requires further input from the planning board prior to obtaining a building permit. 15. The master deed for the condominium association shall specifically require an annual Title V inspection of the septic systems and provide yearly funding for replacement, repair, and pumping costs of the system in, a, in an amount to be provided by the applicant subject to approval by the BOH. Provisions for maintenance of the system shall be the responsibility of the Com condominium association. 16. No unit shall contain a garbage disposal. The master deed shall include a prohibition on the installation and use of garbage disposals for all units on the site. 17. All areas identified in the vegetated easement are non-disturbance areas. This includes the area in the 50-foot buffer to Chief Justice Cushing Highway, except as needed for access as part of the common driveway easement. No removal of trees or vegetation is allowed in the area except removal of dead trees by hand. The Condominium Association shall maintain sufficient funds to replace screening as shown on the plans between common driveways to maintain an effective screen in perpetuity. A physical delineation on the ground shall be provided with signage and fencing or boulders, rocks, so that the no disturbance zone is clearly marked. The signage and fencing, boulders, rocks shall be installed prior to issuance of the first building permit at approximately 50 foot intervals. The sign shall be white with dark green lettering, constructed of durable waterproof material, a minimum of one square foot in area and four feet in height, or as otherwise approved by the town planner. The signs shall state open space, no disturb zone. 18. No additional alteration is permitted in the drainage easement other than the drainage shown on the plan. 19. No work is allowed beyond the limit of work tree line without prior written approval. <clears throat> of the planning board. The entire limit of work is to be staked with erosion control during each phase of the project. Any disturbance beyond the limit of work shall be fully restored in accordance with a restoration plan submitted to and approved by the planning board and a fine of $5,000 as well. Common driveway agreement. 20. A common driveway agreement shall assign to the owners of lots 1 through 8 the responsibilities and costs of maintenance and repair of the common driveways, including snow plowing, as well as the catch basins, rain garden, drainage devices, grading, and all other improvements for stormwater management in the common driveway easement and drainage easements. The responsibilities of maintenance in the common driveway agreement shall include all requirements of the operation and maintenance plan, which shall be attached to the agreement together with other typical maintenance, such as snow plowing, driveway repair, and any Cape God Cape Cod berm repair. The agreement shall require annual certification by a certified licensed engineer that, that the storm water system is being properly inspected and maintained per the operation and maintenance plan. The operation and maintenance plan shall also be provided to the planning board as a standalone document. The standard format 
from the planning office shall be used. A final draft of the agreement shall be provided to the planning board within two weeks of, of the approval of this special permit. The agreement shall be recorded at the Registry of Deeds and any material changes to the agreement shall require planning board approval prior to any such change. 21. The applicant has provided the planning board with a common driveway agreement for Wade Commons Condominium, a Wade Commons Condominium Trust, a master deed for Wade Commons Condominium, and a grave access easement governing the development. The applicant shall file the final executed condominium trust document, which shall not vary substantially from the document provided to the board with the registry of deeds. The filing shall occur prior to the first occupancy permit. The applicant shall provide the town planner and building inspector with copies of duly filed documents. Any material changes to the filed document shall require planning board approval prior to any such change. 22, the master deed filed with the registry shall contain language granting an easement to the town of Situate consistent with the draft master deed language approved by the Situate Planning Board, a copy of which is attached hereto. 23, the vegetated easement, which is intended to remain in its undisturbed natural state, is depicted on the approved plans, shall be incorporated into the master deed and condominium trust in perpetuity. The condominium trust is to be referenced in all deeds conveyed. This condition refer, confers upon the town of Situate the right to enforce this easement in perpetuity. If the easement is altered in any way or manner, it shall be fully replicated and the association fined. 24, a utility easement shall be provided to the town of Situate for maintenance of all stormwater and infrastructure prior to occupancy. 23, the applicant shall meet with the design review committee for review of building design and materials prior to applying for a building permit. Finalization of documents, 26. The plans for the common driveway shall be submitted to the planning board for their signature after the expiration of the 20-day appeal period of this special permit. The plans and special permit shall be recorded together at the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds. All plan sheets of the common driveway special permit shall be recorded, required prior to planning board signing plans. 27. The following notes and changes shall be added to the plan in addition to other conditions. The lots on this plan shall not be further divided or subdivided. The common driveway shall always be owned by the homeowners, shall always remain private, and shall never be maintained by the town or requested to be accepted by the town. A common driveway agreement assigns to the owners of lots 1 through 8. Oh, my goodness, this keeps on going. Um, <clears throat> the responsibilities and costs of maintenance and repair and the common driveways including snow plowing, as well as the rain garden, infiltration basin, grading, and other improvements for stormwater management. No new underground irrigation systems are allowed to connect to the town's water distribution system or in any manner you use municipal water in accordance with the policy of the Board of Selectmen effective October 8, 2014. In accordance with this policy, all irrigation systems installed in situate must be supplied by on-site sources at the expense of the property owner. The use of pesticides and fertilizers are strictly prohibited on the entire parcel. This prohibition shall also be incorporated in the condominium association documents. Use of road salt is strictly prohibited. The source of the contours on the existing condition plans shall be added to the plan. Reserve areas for septic systems shall be shown on the overall layout plan out of the 400 foot buffer to TAC Factory Pond. Plan and calculations for restoration of temporary sedimentation areas. Plan and detail for level spreader slash en energy dissipator at ends of riprap swales. Revised operation and maintenance plan to include organic mosquito control if required and road salt and fertiliz fertilizer prohibition. Delineation of no disturbed zones with rocks, boulders, fencing, and signage and no disturbed areas noted on plans. Revision of the drain lines at the entr entry of the common driveways for lots 1 and 2, 3, 4, and 5 to keep more than 50 foot no disturbed buffer to Chief Justice Cushing Highway. Clear delineation of the projected border to TAC Factory Pond 
following the increase in the storage capacity of the pond as well as the delineation of the 400 foot buffer from such border. 28, the locations of the dwellings shown on the plans show general location and grading of the dwelling to conform to the stormwater design and minimize impacts on surrounding neighbors. Any material deviations from the plans require notification of the town planner and impacts from the proposed deviations shall be addressed prior to, any, prior to issuance of any building permits. Material deviations include but are not limited to moving of a dwelling by more than four feet and changing grading by more than one foot. The applicant shall certify that changes shall result in no impact on the drainage system and shall not increase runoff onto the Chief Justice Cushing Highway abutting lots or the rate and volume of the post condition from the pre-development condition. 29, prior to the start of construction for each phase, the limits of work shall be staked in the field. No trespass into open space shall be preserved or into additional phase is allowed. The stake area shall include a buffer around mature trees that are intended to be saved to prevent damage from storing equipment or stockpiling loam. The location of the stakes shall be reviewed in the field by the planning board, consulting engineer, in conjunction with the town planner and DPW. 30, a mounding analysis shall be provided for the roof dry well infiltration units prior to any construction. 31, the project shall be phased according to the applicant's phasing schedule. Phase one, lots six, seven, and eight. Phase two, lots four, five, and six. And phase three, lots one and two. The three phase, phases are separate and distinct phases. Each phase must be completed, stabilized, and occupied prior to commencing the next phase. This includes clean, clearing and grubbing. The applicant must appear before the planning board at a public meeting prior to be giving permission to proceed with an additional phase. For each of the three common driveways, the following procedure is required. Before any clearing or grubbing begins, a minimum of three test pits witnessed by the town designee shall be conducted to confirm the required three-foot separation exists between the bottom of the rain garden outlet and any drainage device and the maximum groundwater elevation as required for drainage device in the Water Resource Protection District. The infiltration rates of the parent subsoil must also be confirmed. The applicant shall provide to the planning board an interim as-built plan prepared and stamped by a licensed professional engineer as soon as the rain garden is rough graded to further confirm the required three foot separation between the bottom of the basin and the maximum groundwater elevation exists as required in the plan in the water resource, water resource protection district. The interim as built plans shall be reviewed and approved by the planning board or its agent. No further site work or construction shall take place until the required three foot minimum separation has been confirmed by an additional three test pits and the infiltration rates are confirmed. No building permits shall be issued until this has been verified by the planning board or its designee. Construction of the common driveways, drainage systems, and all utilities shall be supervised by a registered professional engineer approved by the planning board who shall certify in writing to the planning board during construction and at com Completion that the driveways, grading, grading systems, utilities, and dwellings were constructed in accordance with the approved plans. This certification shall be accompanied by as built plans signed and stamped by a registered professional land surveyor and the supervising professional engineer. An additional three test pits shall be required to confirm that the required three foot minimum separation to from the bottom of the rain garden to the maximum ground water level exists. No further site work or construction, including going into an additional phase, shall take place until the required three-foot minimum separation has been confirmed by the additional three test pits along with the infiltration rates. Upon start and completion of subsequent phases, three additional test pits shall be taken in the lowest rain garden and outlet structure to verify that the three feet of separation to groundwater is being maintained throughout the project along with the infiltration rates as certified by the applicant's engineer and confirmed by the town's consulting engineer. A plan for restoration of the temporary sedimentation basin areas shall be provided prior 
and approved prior to endorsement. Since the basins required clearing of a substantial area and the ground cover will change in these areas from existing woods to grass or other landscaping, the impact upon the stormwater management system calculations should be reviewed with updated calculations provided and approved prior to endorsement. A landscape plan inclusive of evergreen and deciduous trees and shrubs to restore the area should be provided and stamped by a registered landscape architect and approved prior to endorsement. 13. The riprap swales which, dis which discharge flows from the Ray Gardens <clears throat> will have significant velocities. A lever spreader energy dissipator shall be incorporated into the design at the end of each swale. Prior to endorsement, the design shall be reviewed and approved prior to endorsement. Construction. A pre 34. A pre-construction conference will be required prior to the start of construction, including the planning board's consulting engineer, a representative of DPW, the site design engineer, the owner, the site contractor, and the town planner. 35. Prior to scheduling a pre-construction conference, the applicant shall provide to the town planner a proof that the endorsed plans and decision have been recorded at the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds. B copies of the NIPDES permit including the stormwater pollution prevention plan SWIP. The SWIP must be submitted at least 21 days prior to any land disturbance. The authorized person doing the SWIP inspections shall be noted an initial deposit with the town planner of $30,000 under Mass General Law, Chapter 44, sub, um, Section 53G, to secure construction review and inspections by the town of Situa Consulting Engineer. The deposit shall be applied to the construction of, to the cost of construction inspections for all three common driveways. The specific amount pro provided to the planning department shall be based on the consulting engineer's estimate and shall be subject to amendment from time to time and be supplemented by the applicant as required. D. The applicant shall provide surety for $1,250,000 in the form of acceptable to the planning board prior to beginning construction of the common driveways to guarantee completion of the common driveways, the drainage systems, site work, landscaping, and cleanup of the site. After the town planner has inspected the site and found grading, loaming, seeding, cleanup of earth materials, and construction debris to be complete, these funds shall be returned to the applicant. And E, a schedule of construction activities, including appropriate dates for installation of erosion control and other site stabilization features for all phases of the project and all applicable items in the subdivision rules and regulations 9.1.3 shall be given to the town planner and the applicant shall provide funds to cover the cost of inspections and attendance at pre-construction conference by the town's consulting engineer. 36, the town planner shall be notified prior to commencement of construction and upon completion of construction. 37, prior to construction. Scheduling the pre-construction conference, the applicant shall provide the town planner with permits from the Mass DOT for access and utility crossings and the Situa DPW for street openings and water system connections to the town's water system. Installation of all water mains and impertinences shall be performed according to the specifications of the DPW Water Division. Any upgrades, modifications, or connections shall be at the town's expense at the applicant's expense, excuse me. The consulting engineer along with the town shall review the construction activity to, to assure compliance with the town's rules and regulations. 38, the property line and boundary of the limit of clearing shall be marked or flagged in the field under the direction of a licensed professional surveyor and notification given to the town planner and consulting engineer a minimum of five days prior to the start of construction. 39, a stabilized construction entr entrance, as shown on the plans, must be installed prior to any earth disturbing activities on site, including but not limited to clearing and grubbing. Construction access must be clearly identified with site signage approved by the town planner. 40, all clearing and earth moving operations shall only occur while erosion and sedimentation control measures approved by the town planner and shown on the plan are in place. 
Such control measures shall remain in place until the town planner determines that the danger of erosion or cementation no longer exists. 41. Erosion control shall remain in place and be maintained during the entire construction phase. Limits of disturbance shall be staked in the field and inspection pr inspected prior to the start of any tree clearing and maintained throughout the project life. Special attention shall be made to the erosion control placed at the southerly limit of the project until all slopes are vegetated and stable. No additional disturbance beyond that shown on the plan is allowed. 43, all lawns shall have a minimum of six inches of screen loam. 44, no use of hydrants on site or adjacent roads off site is allowed for construction use. A hydrant is available at the water treatment plant for construction use. 45, there shall be no rock crushing on site. Blasting, if necessary, shall only occur after all necessary permits have been obtained and all the requirements of the Situate Fire Department have been met. 46. The plantings for the rain gardens shall be confirmed by a wetland scientist who shall field locate the plants in the rain gardens during construction and certify to the planning board that the size and amount and locations are per the plans. 47. The rain garden and swales shall be fully constructed and fully vegetated before storm water is directed to them. 48. All imported fill, compost, loam, soil amendments, etc., must be accompanied by soil test results to verify physical characteristics and chemical composition. The applicant must must be the applicant must be verify must verify that materials used on the site do not contain contaminants such as excess nutrients pesticides, metals, construction debris, invasive plant seeds, or vegetation. Such materials shall be provided by a licensed supplier processor and be accompanied by a statement of origin and or bill of lading. 49, the, the inspections for this development shall be done in accordance with section 9.1.3 of the Town of Situate Subdivision Rules and Regulations. The town's consulting engineer shall perform these inspections with costs paid by the applicant. All required inspections shall take place and be inspected by the consulting engineer, including water system components along with, the, with DPW. Weekly reports shall be submitted to the applicant and planning board stating the results of all required inspections, including test pits, unless more frequent reports are needed. 50. Construction of the common driveways, site drainage systems, and water systems shall be supervised by a registered professional engineer approved by the planning board who shall certify in writing. Excuse me for one minute. Oh, my goodness. Of, um, excuse me. Construction of the common driveways, site drainage systems, and water systems shall be supervised by a registered professional engineer approved by the planning board who shall certify in writing to the planning board <clears throat> at completion that the driveways, grading, drainage structures, and utilities were constructed in accordance with the approved plans. This certification shall be accompanied by as-built plans signed and stamped by a registered professional land surveyor and the supervising professional engineer. No certificate of occupancy shall be issued until the planning board is satisfied that access construction of the driveways, grading, installation of drainage structures, and stormwater management features, installation of utilities, and site stabilization are in full compliance with the approved plans special permit and three foot separation to the maximum groundwater exists. The stormwater system must be functioning in accordance with the design requirements and the as-built certification must include a statement that any variation in grade is immaterial and does not material alter the performance of the stormwater system. 51, prior to the issuance of an occupancy permit, the board's consulting engineer shall inspect the lots, notify the board and building commissioner that the common driveways, grading, drainage, site utilities, and stabilization conforms to that shown on the common driveway plan. Construction work shall not begin prior to 7 a.m. on weekdays and 8 a.m. on weekdays ends and shall cease no later, no later than 7 p.m. or sunset, whichever is earlier. No construction is permitted on Sundays and federal and state legal holidays. Construction work includes any operation of machinery and idling of vehicles. 
The name and phone number of a 24-hour contact shall be provided to the town planner, building department, police department, and department of public works to be used in the event of an emergency. 53, police details may be required for construction access to the site. The applicant shall notify the town 48 hours in advance of significant equipment and construction material arrival to the site, which may cause a safety hazard or material disruption of the public way, such that a police detail is necessary to ensure safe passage. Any police detail required shall be provided at the sole expense of the applicant. 54, there shall be no parking, staging, or idling of vehicles on Chief Justice Cushing Highway or adjacent public roads during construction. 55, stockpiles shall be located as shown on the plans and must be protected with erosion controls, including but not limiting to silt socks and temporary seating. 56, inspections and observations made according to the stormwater pollution prevention plan shall be submitted to the board within 48 hours after inspection. The board reserves the right to require the consulting engineer to visit the site as frequently as necessary during times when construction inspections are further than one week apart. Because this is an environmentally sensitive area, an engineering construction engineer shall be hired by the applicant to ensure the project is built according to the plans before, during, and after construction. 57. Construction activities shall be conducted in a workmanlike manner at all times. Noise mitigation and proper dust control shall be taken so that levels conform to mass DEP policies. All equipment that emanates shall emanate sound shall be kept in proper working order through regular maintenance. Street sweeping shall be used to control dust from leaving the site. A wheel wash station may be required to prevent sediment from leaving the site. Blowing dust or debris shall be controlled by the applicant through stabilization, wetting down, or other proper storage and disposal methods. 58. Construction activities on site shall conform to Town of Situate General Bylaws. 59. Signage shall be installed on each common driveway indicating that, the road, that road salt is not in use to protect the town's water, is not to be used to protect the town's water supply. The condominium master deed shall include the required perpetual maintenance of the signage and shall state that the use of road salt on the common driveways is prohibited. 60. Signage identifying house numbers shall be provided as submitted unless otherwise recommended to be changed for 911 purposes. House numbers shall be reflective and visible from approaching the, approaching the driveways from nor, um, north and south. Shop drawings shall be submitted for approval to the town planner who will forward them to appropriate 911 personnel for approval. 61, sight lines on Chief Justice Cushing Highway shall be maintained per the plans. <clears throat> no cons uh, 62, no construction other than common driveway entrances shall be permitted in the 50-foot buffer to Chief Justice Cushing Highway. Except for driveways and approved landscaping shown on the plans, the buffer shall be a non-disturbance zone. 63, all construction shall comply with all applicable requirements of the Water Resource Protection District. No finished slopes shall exceed 4 to 1. 64. Spill control provision shall be provided for each common driveway. A certification of such installation shall be provided to the town planner. 65. No certificate of occupancy shall be issued until both the planning board and building commissioner are satisfied that access, construction of the common driveways, and installation of necessary utilities are in full compliance with the approved plans and the conditions of the special permit. 66. Any mosquito control required shall be organic in nature. Administration. 67. This special permit shall run with the land and be void if it is not recorded at the registry of deeds within 90 days of the expiration of the appeal period. The applicant shall provide proof of this recording to the planning board. Failure to comply with any condition of this special permit shall cause it to be deemed invalid. Is there a second for discussion?
Is there a second for discussion? Yes. Okay. Bill seconded. All right. Discussion from the board. Any further comments from the board? Yeah, I think it goes back to does it meet some of the, the requirements, specific requirements, criteria for this common driveway permit, special permit. They don't think it, it addresses the sensitivity to the water or to our water supply. I think we've, we've touched on it, this, the, the linear discussion. I think it also comes back out and it doesn't adequately protect the wetlands from disturbance. I think we're disturbing a tremendous amount of the slot. I think, I think that the design, is, the proposed design is very aggressive, just basically relying on the three large gardens. But I think we've still got the interaction of one on the other two. And I don't think that most homeowners associations would come back up and be cognizant of what exactly they have to do and when they do it because the rain garden will take it, a lot of things that need to be done on a normal day to day week to week basis. So that's cleaning them out whether the plants are dead or whether you got debris, your outlets, your inlets, your, your banks, your berms, all the pieces that are put in, the erosion control. And then particularly the one I'm concerned about is plant replacement. So, and I'm really concerned about how this thing gets all phased out, built in, in phases. I, I agree with you, Bill, on all those points. I think it's pretty clear that um, we should have at least a 400 foot um, buffer as indicated by multiple parties here. And given that we know that part of the development is in that 400 foot buffer, um, I don't think there's anything we could do to fix that here. Um, and, uh, you know, as you say, it's in, in a significant, uh, it's a significant development within a, uh, you know, a, a water protection zone that's critical. Close to the watershed, getting even closer um, as the, as the, uh, level of the reservoir may increase and we're starting to phase it in the closest place to the reservoir. Uh, there's, there are multiple components of this, I think, that uh, make this project uh, just uh, not uh, not a project that I think we should approve. Yeah, I think I wrote made a note on item four. I said in the findings, it says address the technical terms and definitions for the project area. But the reality is that whatever you call them, you still have an impact on our water supply. So I think that. Agreed. Okay. I would also point out that even in the conditions, we identify sort of uh, uh, note, notations about a 400 foot buffer, but, um, but uh, there's development in the 400 foot buffer. So I think that it's. It's essentially a fatal flaw for the uh, for the development. Agreed. Patty, do you have yeah. any? I agree with both gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Ben, are you still with us, Ben? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Um, I yeah, I'm in general agreement. I'm again, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the development of this parcel in general. However, I think that there's, well, there's literally an infinite, infinite number of ways that it could have been developed. And I think that throughout this process, I think the board has tried to reiterate that this is kind of an overly aggressive use 
of this site, and that I think that um, we, we could have done a lot better and um, would, would have been much more amenable to um, approving the special permit. Okay. All right, Rebecca. Is Rebecca still with us? Uh, I just agree with what um, Ben just said. Okay. All right. Um, this is a very aggressive plan. I think that um, I agree with Ben in that maybe something a little bit smaller might have been better. But that being said, um, I will take a vote on whether or not. I think you should agree. All right, Greg. Thank you for the opportunity to talk here. As you know, this planning, not this planning board, but the Situate Planning Board in the past has reviewed and approved three other projects on this property. Those projects were all significantly larger in size and disturbed almost twice the land area that this project does. We came in with a proposal to include common driveways to reduce impervious areas. We came in with duplex units to cluster this development so that it would preserve over 50% of the land area. Most importantly, I hear from Mr. Pritchard that we don't comply with sections of the zoning bylaw. Section 720.7 outlines the requirements for a special permit and we comply with all of them. We can go through them right now, but we comply with every one of the requirements. I also hear discussion about a 400 foot setback. The regulatory setback in Tax Factory Pond is 200 feet. That has been confirmed by the DEP and the town of Situate DPW. We have provided a 400-foot setback to the septic system. You will not find anywhere in the zoning bylaw that prohibits a house or land clearing within the 400-foot setback to the tax factory pond. I, I ask you to point me to where in the bylaw we aren't allowed to put a structure or clearing within 400 feet because it is allowed and it's done all the time. <clears throat> Please point to one section of 720.7 that we don't comply with because it seems like you're relying on non-compliance with the zoning bylaw when this project was well thought out and is in full compliance. I have it in front of me and can go through you for the sections if you would like. I'll await the chair. Karen? The decision was based on the fact that the board has said numerous times that they wanted the 400-foot buffer respected. Technically, you are maybe right that the DEP says it's only 200 feet, but the secretary of the EOAA said that basically this is a public water supply and the board has determined that it should have a 400-foot protection zone. Um, common driveways are so also supposed to protect sensitive natural areas from disturbance, including stormwater runoff. And based on that fact, and the items enumerated in the findings of fact one through eight, the board felt that it did not meet that standard of a common driveway. All right, um, 720.7a. Greg, I understand you're saying that three other times that previous planning boards have allowed larger projects on this property. However, times have changed. 
Our water supply is dearer to us now than it has ever been. And we have to do everything in our power to ensure the maintenance and the viability of our water resources. And maybe 10, 15 years ago, this would have flown, but unfortunately, regardless, today it can't. Not within the water resource protection. It's too dear. And, and as I stated after, when you first came before this board, after the last town meeting, people are very, very concerned about water. Very concerned. So be that as it may, I understand the work that you have put into this, but it is not something that I can support. And it has to do more with water than anything else. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Um, we've had a, a second for discussion. And I'll call for a, a motion. I have a motion. We have a motion on the floor. Yes, we have a motion on the floor to approve the project. All those in favor of the project, the roll call. Ms. Burbine? No. Mr. Pritchard? No. Mr. Limbacher? No. Ms. Mr. Bornstein? No. 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 Miss Lambert. Miss Lambert. No. Unanimous. No. The um special permit fails. Thank you very much. I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Second. Patty, say second. Second. All in favor. Echo sounded like you seconded. <laughs> All Ms. in favor. Yes. Mr. 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 Yes. Yes. We have um, a Form A, A and R for 443-461 Chief Justice Cushing Highway, um, Assessor's Map Block Lot 47-2-26A to 26J. Um, Mr. Morris, do you want to continue with this Form A? Yes. Okay. I move to endorse <clears throat> as a... It just tell us what you're doing. I would like to seek endorsement for this Form A plan. It meets all of the requirements. While I am disappointed in the previous vote, the project will be developed at some point, and I would like endorsement so that the loss can move forward. <clears throat> I move to endorse as approval not required a plan of land in the town of Situate, Mass. 443 to 461 Chief Justice Cushing Highway, prepared by Morse Engineering Company, Inc., for applicant David McCready and owner 7H Trust, dated 424-19, with a revision date of 129-2020, as the division of land shown on the accompanying plan is not a division, subdivision because it shows every lot on the plan has frontage of at least the distance presently required under situate zoning bylaw on the public way of Chief Justice Cushing Highway with the planning board stamp added that the planning board endorsement of the plan is not a determination as to the conformance with zoning regula regulations. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Ms. Garbine? Yes. Mr. Pritchard? Yes. Mr. Limbacher? Yes. Ms. Lambert? No. Mr. Bornstein? Yes. 
All right, it passes. Four to one. Four to one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morse. All right, we have a continued public hearing, special permit, residential compound development, and stormwater permit for Zero Country Way, somewhere around here. Ah, uh, here we are. <clears throat> I move to accept the applicant's request to continue the public hearing for a residential compound special permit for Zero Country Way until May 28, 2020 at 7.02 p.m. and to continue the time for action for filing with the town clerk until June 30, 2020. Second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Burbine? Yes. Aye. Mr. Percher? Aye. Mr. Lebacher? Yes. Mr. Bornstein? Yes. Ms. Ms. Lambert? Yes. Thank you, all in favor? Unanimous. All right, people. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> Ms. Oh, Burbine? Yes. Mr. Richard? Yes. Mr. Limbacher? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mr. Bornstein? <laughs> Yes. Ms. Lambert? Yes. Thank you all in favor. We are adjourned. So, Ben, good luck tonight. Oh, thanks. It, it, the things seem to have calmed down. So. Oh, oh, thank you for coming. Probably going to be another couple days here. Okay. Well, good luck. Good luck. Keep us. Yeah. <laughs> Keep us posted. Good luck. Thank you all.